Before I made a living making D&D stuff, I had a blog about my homebrew world. I was super excited about the latest edition of the game, called D&D Next back then. And, like every DM, I wanted to make stuff for it. The monsters, magic items, spells, and more I posted on that blog got some attention. Then, the DMs Guild came out, and I thought, why not make a few bucks by taking some of that stuff and selling it over there? After two years or so of creating for myself, a few publishers reached out and asked if they could give me money to write some stuff for them. From there, I got to work as a freelancer on seven official D&D releases, and even lead a design team in creating an original sci-fi RPG. And now, I'm sitting in this chair. Hi folks, I'm James Intracasso. I'm MCDM's lead game designer. A question us tabletop game designers get a lot is, how can I do what you do for a living? Some people just respond, just start writing. That answer is two things, honest and unhelpful. But I get it. A detailed answer takes a lot of time, which luckily, I have right now. The first thing to know is that most publishers aren't going to hire someone with no experience. For instance, I don't hire people to write for us if they don't have at least a few credits to their name. You might be wondering, wait a second, if no one is going to hire me, how am I supposed to get experience? The answer is self-publishing. Before you freak out, self-publishing isn't as scary as it sounds. When I was a little kid, self-publishing was a lot harder because it meant a big investment of your own money into getting a print run of a book. But nowadays, you can blog for free. Self-publishing is blogging, printing your own books, and everything in between. For your first project, you should start small. You're going to hear me say this a lot in this video. Starting small is really important when it comes to self-publishing because you'll learn a lot of new skills that take time and practice to develop. Do you think Batman started his career fighting the Joker? No way! First, he trained abroad for 12 years, and then, then, he got beat up in a street brawl by some no-names on his first night out. Can you imagine if he ran into the Joker that night? Blogging, which is basically typing words into the internet that can be quickly edited, is easier than creating your own PDF, because that involves at least some graphic design skills and takes more time to update. Which is easier than putting together a print product, because that requires expertise in game design, 10 times the work, and a big monetary investment. Plus, once those books are printed, there's no easy way to fix mistakes or make updates. Start with a blog post or a short PDF that you can distribute for free or sell on a platform like DriveThruRPG or itch.io. Itch.io. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the doobly-doo. You should also start small in scope. One common mistake a lot of first-time designers make is that they think designing games takes as much work and the same skills as running games. Oh, my sweet summer child, what do you know about fear? While there is definitely some overlap, running games and designing games are very different beasts. When you run a game for your friends, what you write really only needs to make sense to you, only needs to appeal to your players, and can be changed on the fly. When you're making something for a stranger to use at their table, you need to get all your ideas across in a way that makes sense, is enjoyable to read, and provides a fun experience at the table. In other words, your first project, probably several projects, are going to take more time than you think. A small scope means you're more likely to finish a thing and finish it well. Don't make your first project a new 300-page RPG or a campaign setting. Try something small, in a system that you know and love. For instance, if I were a first-time D&D designer, I wouldn't make a new book of classes or even subclasses for my first project. I'd start with something easy to create, like a book of character backgrounds, which was one of my first projects, or spells or feats or magic items or monsters or maybe a very short adventure. I'm talking side trek length. Check out Death in the Cornfield by Merrick Blackman on DM's Guild if you want an example of a fun and uber short module. Don't write more than 5,000 words. In fact, your first product can have far, far fewer. Death in the Cornfields is fewer than 1,500 words. Now that you understand the size and scope of your project, I'm going to give you what I think is the most important piece of advice when it comes to self-publishing. Write something that excites you. Don't try to chase a trend because you think it will get you big sales. 
If vampires are hot right now, but you hate those suckers, don't go chasing that blood money. Make something that you would use at your table, something you want to see in the world, something that you'll want to work on after a long day at the office or salt mines or wherever. You're going to work on this project for a while, sometimes at the expense of doing other fun stuff like playing video games. It's also going to be a thing you talk about a lot because when you self-publish, you're also your own promoter. More on that later. Make it a thing you want for a system you know well and love. I know D&D is the most popular role-playing game. If you're watching this channel, you probably love it at least as much as I do. But if you don't like D&D for whatever reason, or you don't know it well, don't feel like you need to make stuff for it because it's super popular. If you have an idea for a cool Fate or Morkborg or Chubo's Marvelous wish-granting engine project, you should make that. The process is infinitely smoother when you design for a game that you have played several times and know well. You should check and see what, if any kind of open license, the official publisher has available for the game, especially if you plan to sell the thing you're making. Generally, these licenses cover what you can and can't use in products from the official rules. For instance, D&D has an open license that says you can use a lot of their rules, but you can't use anything that is specifically Wizards of the Coast's intellectual property. D&D didn't invent elves and orcs, so you can use them in your products. But they did invent beholders and mind flares, so you can't use those unless you're publishing on the DM's Guild, which is a different story and has a different license. Frankly, we could do a whole video about licenses, but the links to the D&D ones are in the doobly-doo for you to check out and review. Let's talk about the actual design process. Maybe the first thing you want to make is a 5th edition D&D character background. Good choice. The first thing you should do is go read a bunch of backgrounds. There are a couple reasons to do this. First, you may want to see if what you're planning on making already exists in the official rules for the game. Now, if it does, that doesn't mean you can't make it, but it does mean that you should make something that is different than what already exists. For instance, maybe you want to make a D&D &D background for adventurers who have already achieved a bit of fame, a folk hero background. One of these already exists in the player's handbook. Instead of making your background for some fresh-faced baby hero like the official one, maybe you can make a background for a different kind of folk hero. Maybe someone who got too famous too fast and then dealt with the pressure by spending all their treasure on partying instead of adventuring. The burnout! Or maybe this character had a hero career on the rise brought down by one little scandal, the disgraced. Or maybe they were a grizzled adventurer who's been retired for some years and your skills are rusty, the retired adventurer. By knowing what's out there, you can create fresh ideas. You should also read examples of what you're making so that your creation is balanced with the existing options and uses existing game lingo. After reading just a few backgrounds, you can see that they consist of skill and tool proficiencies, starting equipment, tables of personality traits, bonds, ideals, and flaws, suggested characteristics, and some languages. You also get a background feature, which is probably the trickiest part of a background to get right mechanically. These features typically allow a character free room and board in a particular situation, and or a special way of gaining specific kinds of information or favors from NPCs. They're typically not super powerful, and almost never provide a mathematical bonus to an ability check, attack roll, or other statistic. Fill all that information in, add a couple paragraphs of description, and blammo! You got yourself a background. That would be a lot harder to figure out if you hadn't read a few backgrounds first. Not every part of the game is so formulaic. In D&D, spells, feats, and magic items are really fun to make, but there's no perfect formula for what makes a wondrous item uncommon versus rare. Did you know that the rarity of plus one weapons and shields is uncommon, but that plus one armor is rare? You'll only learn that by reading it. The Dungeon Master's Guide has some broad advice about making your own elements of the game, but you can find lots of advice online to help you make stuff that's fun and balanced. In fact, I wrote a bunch of advice for creating your own magic items, ancestry, spells, monsters, feats, and backgrounds. Links are in the doobly-doo. Gosh, that's fun to say. Doobly-doo! After you write the thing, read it over a few times. Revise it, show it to a friend for feedback, and play test it. Truly, playtesting takes time, but it's worth its weight in platinum in what it might reveal about your creation. And it's a good excuse to get together with some friends and play a game. 
As a bonus, your players are less likely to cancel last minute because now they're not just goofing off and pretending to be elves. They're helping you out with a work thing while pretending to be elves. Now, when you're self-publishing, you work for yourself. And there's only one problem with that. Your boss can be a real jerk. You can be your own worst critic and hammer on something forever trying to make it perfect. Don't let perfect be the enemy of done. Set a deadline for yourself. Stick to it. Make sure it works with your schedule and give yourself plenty of time. You might need a month or six or a year for a project, but make a schedule so that the project actually gets done. If you're just blogging, you probably don't need art or an editor or a graphic designer to help you with layout. Or you might be a multi-talented person who can make your own art and lay out your own products. But if you're like me and lack visual art skills, then you have other options. If you're putting together a PDF, you'll at least want some cover art for it because contrary to popular belief, people do judge books by their covers. If your art budget is zero dollars, you might be able to find some good public domain art online or by searching Creative Commons and looking for things with a commercial license. If you have a tiny bit of cash, you can find stock art on all manner of sites, including DriveThruRPG. Go to the site and select Publisher Resources under Product Type. You might even be able to find some stuff for free. Be sure to pay attention to the license that comes with the art so that you're crediting the artist properly in the project. Some licenses don't allow you to manipulate art, and others do. If you have a bigger budget, you can always hire an artist. The process of taking all your text and art and making them look good in a PDF or in a book is called layout. If you want to try to lay out your own material, you have all sorts of options to help make your stuff look good. There are free templates all over the internet for all sorts of different games. If you're making D&D content and you got five bucks, this Microsoft Word template is available on the DMs Guild and gives any product a wonderful layout. It was made by Laura Hirschbrunner, an incredible editor who has worked with us at MCDM. Link in the doobly-doo. Laura actually has a link in the product description where folks can grab it for free if they can't afford it. Of course, if you want a super pro layout, you should probably hire a graphic designer. Speaking of hiring someone, it's always a good idea to have an editor who knows the game system you're using look over the product you're selling. I don't just mean someone who can win a spelling bee, though that's a great quality for an editor to have. An editor who can look at your thing and understand how it will interact with the existing rules and lore in the game is great. And having them understand the game's writing style is even better. For instance, did you know that in 5th edition D&D there is no such thing as a skill check? What many folks call a skill check is officially called an ability check, and sometimes skill proficiencies factor into them. I know. Annoying, but also the kind of thing a decent D&D editor knows. Whenever you're hiring anyone, be they artist or editor or another writer, you want to compensate them fairly. Rates vary widely in the industry, so be sure to do research. When you reach out, fairly describe the scope of the project, like how many words need to be edited or what size art you need, and then ask them what they would charge for the job. If you can't afford their rate, you can always counter offer with a little bit of a lower fee and add in a royalty split. In the case of an artist, you could offer to let them keep the rights to their work so that they can sell it as a separate piece after you publish. If someone can't work with you, don't pressure them into it. Come back for another project when you've built up a bit of a war chest and can afford them. After you put your product together, it's time to get it out there into the world. No one's going to check it out if you don't talk about it. I get it. No one likes marketing themselves. I'm no marketing wizard but I can tell you that it will be helpful if you join the various creator communities on your social media platform of choice. There are folks talking game design on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, Discord, forums, and more. It's a great place to plug your stuff, get feedback, and meet other creators. Be sure to give better than you get. Asking for feedback and marketing help is cool, but those requests can get ignored when they come from someone who only ever puts out a bat signal and never answers someone else's. Also, one of the best marketing tools you have is an email list. Start building it early and often. I know, I was shocked too. Email is old tech at this point, but it's one of the most wonderful marketing tools we have at MCDM and one that every other publisher I know swears by. An email list of 10,000 folks is typically more effective in generating sales than 30,000 Twitter followers. Don't expect overnight success. The good news is that once you put something online, it stays there for as long as you leave it up. 
People are still finding products I launched in 2016 and giving me money for them. Pretty cool. If you build up a library of stuff, folks who come to check out your latest thing will explore your other projects as well. Don't get discouraged. I got many rejections from publishers in my first year's blogging and had some products fall flat for years before folks discovered them. But now, I'm sitting in this chair. Thanks everyone for watching. Remember to read and play a lot of games because it helps with your game design. Oh, and if you want a more thorough understanding of making your first product, check out the RPG Writer Workshop from Storytelling Collective. It's an amazing set of online courses that walks you through creating your first product and putting it up for sale. It's all in the doobly-doo. All right, that's it from me. Keep on rolling.